I'll wait now 30 seconds the other way in case people thought maybe this starts at uh, 745. So again, I apologize for the uh, miscommunication. Uh, it was definitely not done on purpose. Um, but we'll, we'll figure it out uh, for next week. Initially, if you remember, the other ones were at 745, but um, this one said 730, so I listened to what it says. So what I would love to do today, um, and it's like a reach, and for me it's a huge reach, only because uh, I'm trying to condense in an hour uh, Jewish history meeting modernity. Now, when do you start the modern period? How do you date the modern period? Is really irrelevant for what we're about to do because the 1500s and the 1600s, uh, enough has happened in the Jewish world and in the world at large to understand literally where we are today and where we come from. So where do the Jewish people today in 2020 uh, as Yom HaZikaron has started, and, and we sit back and think of the Chayalim and everyone else and the Chayalot and every part of, every fiber that makes Israel, who've given up their lives in so many different ways for that country to exist. Um, all of that, in a certain sense, is a little bit of a part of what we will discuss today. So let's begin. So we left you off, if you remember, literally in, in the end of the 1400s. Uh, and all we basically said was that the Jewish people in Spain, and we haven't discussed anywhere else in the world, which I know is really not fair. And again, we can't do it within this. But the Spanish Jewish community in 1492 and soon after the Portuguese community, so all of the Iberian Peninsula, Portuguese, Spain, are, are exiled. That exile changes Jewish history. It is like in Hebrew, it's a galut betoch galut. They're exiled, and the galut of the Jewish people until the state of Israel is a galut betoch galut. In fact, we sometimes speak of us in America as the Galut Sheba America, the diaspora in America, or in Europe, or... But this exiting of so many Jews, and the numbers are not very clear. The smallest number given by some historians who are super conservative, and I think a little bit too conservative, is about 100,000. Uh, more accurately, with very good figures, is something over 200,000, double that number. Chances are it's more like 300,000. But somewhere in between 200,000 and 300,000 Jews leave the Iberian Peninsula, and now they go, but they go everywhere. Literally everywhere. Now the Inquisition will still try to hunt them down in what we call Catholic countries, but suddenly, what should I call it? In this exile within exile, the Jewish people who were a kind of uh, not that proud maybe to be Jews, who now in public can exhibit their Jewishness, including all the Moranos who have come along somehow in here, which is a whole separate story into itself. But this large number of Jews go everywhere. Massive entrances and come back to Amsterdam. But the Jews literally spread across Europe. Some actually go all the way. Some go all the way into Israel. So the, this Galut is taking people back. They haven't been in Israel. Now suddenly there are more Jews there. These Jews come to new communities. Many go to the Ottoman Empire, which already had their own communities with their own customs. And the minute the Ottoman Empire came around, quite powerful Ashkenazi Jews moved from across Ashkenazi countries in Europe to the Ottoman Empire for business. 
and quite many. So the Jews are involved in business and suddenly in each community, which was already established, had its own custom, suddenly there's a new influx of a different type of Jew with different customs and different laws. Now, if you know you have a shul of 10 people and 10, let's say it's a Sephardi shul and you know, 10 Sephardim have a minyan and three Ashkenazim come in, five, okay, big deal. The Batel Barova, as they say, okay, they're insignificant. But when the incoming community outflanks and outranks in number the established existing community and there's only one shul, that begins to create issues. So this upheaval of the movement of the Jews who have left Spain really brings with it earth-shattering changes in the response to literature of the time, in the Shelot and Chuvot. The questions are always about this. You know, the Sephardim had come, and, and they're more than us. Do they now have a majority, and can they take over the board of the shul or the school and their education? And each one has their own poskim and their own halacha, and that begins an entire meshing problem, pro, 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 progress and problem. At the same time, something else already happened in the 1400s as we come into the 1500s. And in the 1500s, its impact will be absolutely, uh, what should I say, it shapes us from then until literally the advent of technology. And that, of course, you know, is the invention of printing. Because in the middle 1400s, when suddenly the printing press is invented and slowly takes off, it didn't make much of an impact in the, in the Muslim world. They were totally opposed to the printing press. But in the Jewish world, the opposite happened. It was the greatest gift Hashem had given us. And already in the 1400s, people began to rush and publish, and Venice will become the great by the 1500s. Venice is the publishing capital of the world with hundreds, hundreds uh, of printing shops in Venice. And many, of course, many will publish Jewish books, Latino books, Yiddish books, and suddenly, everyone has access to what until now was the select few or in the cradle of printing what we call the incunabulas very few copies were printed it was quite expensive but now people have ideas they write them down you know it's not that difficult go to venice go here printing presses show up all the way in prague jewish printing presses and therefore the printing press is literally all around and therefore, there's more discussion. There are more ideas exchanged. And suddenly, that particular notion takes place, and that lands somewhere. But in the midst of all this, um, one of the emigres that actually leaves, leaves Spain, actually Portugal, I should say, quite early, <coughs> uh, is the great Rabbi Yosef Kara. Rabbi Yosef Caro, born in Portugal, uh, born in 1488, by the way, and, and Rabbi Yosef Caro lives quite a long age, at least till 1575, and some say even longer. So imagine from 1488 all the way to the 1570s or maybe even to the 1580s. Here's this person who has grown up in that part of the world who will make such a major contribution of which I'll speak of in a minute that the world changes. And we, we speak of this all the time, but we don't realize the impact it had and the impact it will still have. But this Rabbi Yosef Karo, a very learned person, to make the long story short, and you all know, uh, sits down and comments on the most popular halachic books up until his time. And those were two. Now you might remember back when we discussed the Rambam and the Rambam's Mishneh Torah, which had come into the world and that revolutionized learning as much as it was criticized. But after that, the first book in the 1300s, now printed in the early, in the early uh, advent of printing already in the late 1400s and dozens of editions in the 1500s, 
was the Sefer Haturim, written by Rabbi Yaakov Bal Haturim, the son of Rabbeinu Asher, the great Ashkenazi. But if you remember, Rabbeinu Asher had been exiled from, from Germany uh, and come into Spain. And he survives in Spain, and he teaches Torah in Spain. But his son does something unheard of. It's the first halachic book, the Tur, the Baal HaTorah, written again in the 1300s, but not published until the 1400s and the 1500s, that combined for the first time Ashkenazi opinion and Sephardi opinion, where the Rambam is side by side with the Tostafists where the Rambam is side by side with Ashkenazi opinions, which had never happened before. So the tour had brought them together in the Baal HaTurim. Rabbi Yosef Karo looks at that book and writes a huge commentary to it um, called the Bet Yosef. And in the Bet Yosef, he decided he will collect all the opinions that he was able to, and some that he knew but chose to ignore, and that's a different lecture. But he quotes the opinions, and then subsequently, when he's commented on the entire Balhatorum, which is a massive work, if you've ever seen it, volumes, uh, and so is his commentary. He goes ahead and makes a decision, and I'll go to the end of the story instead of the beginning. He decides to write what we today call literally the constitution of the Jewish people. And it is. That's known as the Shulchan Aruch. Traditional religious Jews, in whatever denomination they are, will at some point think of what they're doing with what the Shulchan Aruch says. Look at it, ignore it, keep it. But that book, initially criticized and not, did not receive a wonderful review of me, like, who are you? You've now decided to tell the Jewish people what the laws of Chagim are, the laws of Brachot, the business laws of how to sell, the business laws of contracts, laws that involve writing a, a ketubah or a get, laws that cover not the laws of the Bet HaMikdash, which the Rambam had done, that is not in here at all, but the practical laws that cover all of Jewish life, literally, were collected in the Shulchan Aruch in a very precise, concise way. And to make a story that we're not getting into, which would be fascinating too, Rabbi Moshe Isselis actually gets to know the Bet Yosef from a distance and somehow the Shulchan Aruch, when it's eventually published, <coughs> has in it the commentary of Rabbi Moshe Islis that the Ashkenazim called the Ramah. And in there, side by side, is the Sephardi and the Ashkenazi opinion for most things. Now, it's an interesting idea, but very soon that book takes central stage. Because it took central stage, the Rambam slightly moved into the background, only slightly, meaning they'll reckon with his opinion, but that's not the book we follow. We now have a new book, which speaks not only to the Sephardi world, to the Ashkenazi world, which means to the entire Jewish world. This is a new book now. Had they not been publishing, its dissemination would have not been possible this way. Had the world not inherited suddenly this other book this would have not been possible. And suddenly the entire Jewish world has a new constitution called the Shulchan Aruch. And we're not discussing it in detail. Again, it, that would require another lecture and it definitely is a worthwhile one. Like what is eventually in there, because beliefs, like what, is, what must the Jew belief is not in the Shulchan Aruch, like why is it not there? Certain mitzvot are not covered in there, like why not? Uh, but as far as practical Jewish life, this particular book um, influences the world. Now, next week, when we'll speak of Poland in detail, this book in the 1600s, Poland, we're not doing that today, 1600s, not in Poland today, just maybe slightly, that book will become the center of learning. And it will remain in the center of Jewish learning as much as we study the Talmud. Halachan, at the end of the day, is not decided from the Talmud. Halakha to this day is followed with the Shulchan Aruch.
Oh. So put into this idea of how modernity comes about, the advent of, of this really amazing book. But something else happens, and Rabbi Yosef Kar was slightly, slightly a part of this, and that is that with the emigres, with the exiles of what we call the Spanish community. Now, in the early 1500s, in the early 1500s, Svat had already become a textile center and by the 1520s, 1530s, many more Jews have arrived from across the world into Tzfat, into Safed. Here, it's communal Balim, the Kabbalists, and we'll speak of them in a minute. But in 1538, the chief rabbi, if you want, uh, of Tzfat, is also a Spanish emigre himself. His name was Rabbi Yaakov Beirav. And with the example of what I'm about to describe to you, what, what Rabbi Yaakov Beirav Rab does, we get another component of what's about to unfold in the future of the Jewish people. Um, based on a statement, that the says, it seems to me, as if he's saying something very original. But a few times he says it, you can bet there is no Talmudic precedent, uh, at least not an open one. And Ramam is being quiet himself. Look, I venture to say the following. One of those things, the, a majority of the Jewish kachamim, like imagine a hundred rabbis, if they would get together, uh, we could renew smicha. Now, smicha today is given to rabbis, and that's not the smicha that Chazal speak about. Uh, the belief is that the smicha uh, of Moshe Rabbeinu to Yoshua was passed on, um, literally, until some point when it dies out. Its simple understanding, at least historically, is that until the Roman time period, people still received this smicha, at which point it might have gotten slightly <clears throat> derailed or maybe continued longer. But for sure, by the Middle Ages, no one can say, I have smicha from my teacher who had received it from his teacher who had received it from his teacher. Just not happening. So therefore, what um, Rabbi Yaakov Beirav wants to institute is get in touch with as many rabbis as he could and find someone worthy of giving them the smicha chachamim now, but with a new impetus, a new power, new authority of the Sanhedrin itself. Now, the Sanhedrin went out of usage in the year 400. 15 thereabout, if you remember, when the Roman government had forbidden the last of the Gamliel, Rabban Gamliel the sixth, the son of the one who earlier had issued that last calendar, Hillel the second, and stopped, no longer allowed what we call the office of the Nazi, who always was the president of the Sanhedrin, and there had not been since the Sanhedrin. But now, Rabbi Yaakov Rab in 1538 wants to renew smicha. By the renewal of smicha, what the Ram, uh, Rambam implies is that we would be entering, implies, some new age. We now have a Sanhedrin. We didn't have it before. Is this a prelude in Rabbi Yaakov Rab's mind and many of the emigres taking the upheaval that had happened to the Jewish community in the world, how devastating the Spanish-Portuguese Jewish community was to such a degree where now suddenly Mashiach must be coming. And for Mashiach to come, we would need a Sanhedrin functioning. Questions that cannot be answered by anyone might be answered by a Sanhedrin. 
in parentheses, if there was, if there would be, sorry, a, a, a really accepted Sanhedrin today by the entire Jewish communities, then many of the arguments we have about things would not exist. There have been many attempts at reviving one in the modern period, according to some, there's one today in the state of Israel. Um, Rabbi Steinsaltz had something to do with, with that renewal, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not what we're discussing. We're actually discussing 1538. Maybe somewhere soon, Mashiach is coming. And we need a Sanhedrin. Now, to make the story kind of sad and short, and again, it's a long involved story and it gets a little bit touchy with some of the personalities on what, and what each one said to each other, that <coughs> Rabbi Yaakov Rav forgot to invite a number of important rabbis. And one of them was at that point, the rabbi of Jerusalem, Rabbi Levi Ibn Khabib, also an emigre of, 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 uh, of Spain and Portugal. And he was not invited. And he had wrote a letter saying like, you know, hey, you forgot me, how could you? Um, I'm not a slouch. I'm just not the guy who's cutting reeds, you know, out there. I'm someone whose opinion you should really check with, which was 100% right. But to make a long story short, a fight ensues, and that's why in history this is called the Smicha controversy. Because Rabbi Yosef Kara, who had already come to Tzvat, is the first person who receives Smicha. In fact, the only one who received smicha directly from this particular group of Yaakov Beirav was Rabbi Yosef Kara. Now he will go on and confer this smicha to a number of other rabbis like the famous al Sheikh, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a different story. But he had already now been conferred as a musmach from this particular now, when this happens, when Rabbi Yosef Karo receives this smicha in Sfat, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero lives, one of the most important Kabbalists of the time. And Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, also with connections back to Spain, um, begins to explain a book that we haven't discussed at all that caused it his own controversy, both in its appearance for the first time in the late 1200s, and definitely it's printing in 1553 or thereabout, uh, that's the Zohar. Moshe Cordovero has studied the Zohar, this text of Kabbalah attributed to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and explained it well, taken its methodology, and suddenly the wisdom of Kabbalah, uh, the beauty of it, is explained to the world. And he's in Sfat. Now, you all remember famous names. Who else is in Sfat? So yes, Rabbi Moshe Alshech is in Sfat. Uh, Rabbi Shlomo Alkabetz, who writes the Lechododi, is, is in Sfat. And Sfat is literally packed with these great people who live in close proximity, who live a very interesting, different type of, of existence. They live more by Kabbalistic ideas where <clears throat> every act of a person has meaning, where every word has meaning, not just in our world, but has powers up above. The concept of theurgy, where the human being has power to affect what happens up in, in the Elyonim, in the upper heavens. Uh, and, and this is a very different community. But then suddenly into this community arrives no, none other uh, than the famous Rabbi Yitzchak Luria. Um, now, Yitzchak Luria doesn't come here uh, until 1568, when some of these great people had already been here for a little bit. Uh, but by 1568, which is almost the end of his life, uh, the Arizal was born in 1534, and then by 1572, he dies. So he's in Tzfat for a very short time, two and a half years or thereabout. And this Isaac Luria, as history calls him, 
Rabbi Yitzchak Luria is known to everyone as the Ari HaKadosh, the Ari Zachron Olavracha, the Lion, Aleph Reish Yud, actually the acronym of Ad- Adonai Rabbeinu Yitzchak, Ari, uh, comes to Tzvat. Again, well-developed methodology of Kabbalah that totally disagrees with the methodology of Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, who in short is known as the Ramak, but that's irrelevant. These are all pioneering and budding and published, or will be published, Jewish mystics. So Tzfat is a city of mystics. The personality, the behavior, call it the holiness to many, the outstanding um, depth of uh, the Ari attracts students. And he himself, uh, supposedly he said it, and his most important student, who's also here at this time, you might have heard his name, Rabbi Chaim Vital, who had actually come from Italy. Rabbi Chaim Vital, his most important student, said that his teacher said, when he asked his teacher, why aren't you writing anything down? And the Ari answered, <coughs> because the ideas rush in my head so fast, I just can't capture them on paper. But you can write it all down. And Rabbi Chaim Vital, a number of other students of the Ari, will record his teachings. And they're massive. They're not one volume. They're volumes, double, sometimes columns in small Rashi print with, with hundreds of pages. But the Arizal had his own methodology of how, again, based on the Zohar and his interpretation of it. But just to give it to you in short, and you must have learned it somewhere, and it's literally, I'm not doing fairness to it, but God, I'll start backwards. <coughs> God creates a world um, out of this great goodness that he has, but he has no space to create a world. And don't ask any questions if you do. Just email me, we'll try to explain it. But imagine for a minute that the entire expanse of the universe, imagine the, the room you're in is the universe. Of course, it's not the universe to us human beings is infinite. Even though at some point, who knows where that infinite point is, there must be an end. But in whatever the universe is, the Arizal had claimed, before there's a physical world, God's presence, the Shekhinah, it's light, and that's how he explains it. The light of the Shekhinah had inundated every drop. There's not a place to make a world. So for God to create a world, he must undergo an act of almost self-exile, um, which is called tzimtzum, contraction, where Hashem has to contract unto himself. The example always given is, is think of a light, and for the modern mind, it will make much more sense. Think of a flashlight. You're in a dark room, you stand far away from the wall, you shine the flashlight 30 feet down, and as you get closer to that wall, the light gets smaller, but no way, shape, or form does the light lose any of its, uh, of its light. In fact, it gets brighter. And somehow God contracts them to himself. And that's a huge act of chesed. That's the grace and the beauty of God himself to almost punish himself, to make himself uncomfortable, to create space for a world. At which point he now, out of the goodness of real good that God is, the world is created, a step in between called Shvirat HaKelim, the vessels that held this light are so filled with light that sparks of it fall into the physical world. And you must have heard of this, that concept of everything in this world has sparks. And therefore, the philosophy of the Arizal is this idea that every single mitzvah that we do, uh, we redeem the spark in the object from as something as mundane as making a bracha and a glass of water. In the water, if you want, in the cup that you're drinking, there's a spark. One makes a bracha on it, they redeem the sparks. Again, don't ask questions. When all the sparks will have been redeemed, all the sparks that fell into all of the universe in, in all of creation, uh, at that point, Mashiach will come. 
therefore, in the system of the Ari, um, it's the human being who works in concert with God that will allow Mashiach to come. There, Hashem creates this world in, in, in what we call Lurianic uh, philosophy or Kabbalah, where we have the power by doing the right things and redeeming all the sparks to bring about Mashiach. Now, the Arizal had told the students, do not reveal this, keep it privately. In fact, he said, my Torah should only be learned and studied in the land of Israel. But of course, it was not to be. Uh, some of his own students had taken the stuff into Europe and then suddenly in the later 1500s, the Kabbalah of the Ari begins to spread. Not as much as it will spread in the 1600s, but it's already there in the 1500s. And that's in short, and I know I apologize, I'm not doing any fairness at all <coughs> to this entire concept or to the Arizal, but just begin to realize how this will also change the world. There's a new knowledge in the Jewish world now that was never there for the masses, that private individuals, one in 10 cities knew what Kabbalah was, who studied it. So the idea of making Kabbalah popular and accessible comes out of Tzfat in this particular time period. And it continued uninterrupted, obviously, uh, un until today. Uh, you might have been in the old city and actually seen that building in the Jewish quarter right not that far from the Sephardi Center with that gorgeous silver door, which is the Bet Knesset Le Hamakubalim. I don't know if you ever had time to step in there to Daven Mincha, but that takes quite a while. That's where the people walk around wearing white. Um, but that's a long chain from the people who started out uh, here in Sfat uh, in the 1500s. So imagine what has happened in the Jewish world so far. <clears throat> the advent of printing has again taken Kabbalah and put it out there. This constitution of the Jewish people has been out there. The influx of these communities across the world are beginning to change how those communities function. Now, what we're not doing, which we should do at some point, who knows, lots of good lectures in between, but um, is the idea that these emigres that had left Spain, some traveled into South America, down into Brazil and other areas. Some also will come within the next century from South America or not directly from Spain in 1492, but when the, within the next generation or two and come to the Caribbean, to this part of the world, they'll come to the Americas. In fact, the first Jewish community um, of 20 some Jews that comes into this country in the, in the 1600s, in the mid 1600s, comes from Brazil. So the American Jewish history part, with which God's help, maybe one of these lectures or a series later on we'll get to, begins as an outgrowth of the emigres of Spain again. But these emigres have gone as far as China. 1605, we hear of emigres in Kaifeng, China, uh, where people, and then eventually we speak of the Kaifeng Jews. And they've gone all the way to Cochin, India, so they've traveled the world. But one of the places where these emigres have come uh, in the 1600s, uh, in the late 1500s, I should say, early 1600s, is to the city of Amsterdam. And I mentioned Amsterdam, for those of you who are listening, who've been to these lectures before, you might remember a, a while back my lecture on Amsterdam and the Jewish history of Amsterdam, which is quite fascinating, uh, which already had some Ashkenazi community, um, but now the Sephardi communities here, uh, most of them are Portuguese Jews. And this particular community um, of Amsterdam gets into printing books, 
some of you might have seen and been in, in Amsterdam and visited the Spanish Portuguese synagogue, which eventually gets built from a number of much smaller synagogues and places. But it's in this community that I want to speak of, of something kind of interesting. And that is, uh, let me just pull up my document and then I'll share it with you. Okay, so let me share my screen with you in a second. Let me just pull it up. Okay, you should all be now seeing a picture. Um, I'm assuming at least half of everybody here can tell me who that is a painting of. Uh, so if you wanna put on your, your speaker for a second, one of you and just tell me who they think that is, um, let me know. If not, I'll tell you. That is not, names? sorry? Two names, Menashe Ben Yisrael or Baruch Spinoza. Okay, Henry, how are you? Uh, take a pick. Which of the two? Menashe Ben Yisrael. You'd think it's Menashe Ben Israel because he's so important to the 1600s in Amsterdam. And the answer is not. It's the second one you said. So I, please. I said Okay, so it is Spinoza for those of you who said it. So those of you who still have your, your mics, please uh, mute them for a minute. Here is Spinoza. Now, Spinoza's family had come to, to uh, and are you wondering for a second, why in the world, this is a lecture of Jewish history, am I putting up there the most famous, infamous Jew in the world, um, and that is Baruch Spinoza, known as Benedict Spinoza, or as they called him, uh, Bento, who was born in 1632 and dies in 1677 at the age of 44. This particular young man sadly became uh, an orphan from his father quite early and left his Jewish learning. Uh, he knew Hebrew, he learned Tanakh with some very important people. How much of the Talmud he actually knew is not very clear. If he did, it was more of a smattering. Midrashim, Rashi, he seems to have known slightly. Even his quotations of Ibn Ezra, which he relied on for a number of things, are slightly not exactly the way we had them, so he might have misquoted them. <clears throat> but let me now, for a second, move to the second document. Uh, and let's read this together. On July 27th of 1656, uh, a sentence of, of excommunication was pronounced on a 24-year-old Jew of the Portuguese community in Amsterdam and recorded in the communal book as follows. The gentlemen of the Mamad, the ruling council, make it known to you, everyone in Amsterdam, that having for some time known the evil opinions of works of Baruch and his Portuguese full name, De Spinoza, they have endeavored by various way and, pro and promises to draw him back from his evil ways and not being able to remedy him. But on the contrary, receiving every day more news about the horrible heresies he practices and taught to others, uh, the awful deeds he performed and having of this many reliable testimonies, all given in the presence of, presence in the, of the said Espinoza, which convinced them. And all of this having been examined in the presence of the gentlemen, the Chachamim uh, of the Spanish community, sorry, Portuguese, they resolved that the latter's consent that he, said Espinoza, be put to Cherem uh, and banished from the nation of Israel 
And indeed, they proclaim the following cherem on him, and only part of it is here, namely, by the decree of the angels and the word of, word of the saints, we ban, cut off, curse, etc., with all the curses in the Torah. It goes on with all the curses of whatever and whatever. Um, and therefore, people should not speak to him. People should have nothing to do with him. Now, what was it about this particular fellow that um, caused such an upheaval? And the answer is that Spinoza, it seems, and the story deserves an hour, but we don't have an hour. Uh, and he does deserve a chapter in Jewish history because this was the Jew who was the first modern Jew. Here's the Jew who was the first secular Jew. And that did not exist before Spinoza. So as a historical point, you can't understand Jewish history without understanding what Spinoza had done. Now, the man was quite brilliant, um, no doubt about it. And Spinoza had grown up religious. Um, in fact, it's quite clear how much money he donated to the shul, to this Portuguese Spanish synagogue, uh, almost up until the time that, that he is excommunicated by the community. And there's no clear evidence in any of the records that he actually transgressed any laws in public anyway. Uh, except there's one person who had testified that they said that he desecrated the Shabbat. But Spinoza, you couldn't really, and this will be true till his dying day, um, Spinoza was never accused of doing anything wrong to anybody. But what's quite clear is that his mind led him to a point where, being brilliant, he began to question many things. Uh, he had been exposed quite early by his own choice to Latin and studied Latin uh, and began to study everything. And one of the teachers that he studied with was Rabbi Shaul Halevi Mortera, who was the chief rabbi uh, for a while of that, one of the chief rabbis of that community, quite learned quite irrational, quite a follower of Maimonides. So clearly at an early age, he begins to venture into the more in the of the Rambam. But as much as, the, as a rational that Maimonides was, Spinoza went beyond that rationalism. He had learned of the philosophy of Descartes uh, just earlier, that was just becoming popular in the world of uh, people of free thought. In the religious world, uh, Descartes was excommunicated. But Baruch Spinoza or Benedictus Spinoza took the philosophy of Descartes a step further. And, um, but he discussed some of these ideas before he had written them down. And the young men, his age, were asking him, like, Why, what do you think of this? And he said, well, I don't believe in this because of this, and I need proof of this, very methodical, very mathematical. In fact, his first book that's published after he had passed on, the very famous Ethics, that book, <coughs> unless you, it's a, just, you know, Google it and just actually don't because it's maybe in Kherim, you don't want to read what we call real Kfira, but it pays to look at it for a second, where it's an entire book of axioms, theories, and step one, step two, step three, very mathematical, uh, but quite clear leading to a point where God is not the God we speak of in Spinoza's understanding. The God that we speak of is the God of Abraham, the God that performs miracles, the God that we turn to. In the philosophy of Spinoza, God is, and uh, to, to make it quite clear, God is nature. Um, God is nature, if you understand what that means in this philosophy. But 
to make it even worse, the next book that was published, and again, ideas that he had discussed earlier, um, and that's the book that got him in trouble for generations <coughs> when he had already been, been placed in Kherim. And that's the Tractus Theologico uh, Politico, his treatise on theology and politics, where he came to shocking conclusions that the entire Torah, which now affected not only Jews, but the entire, all of Christendom, not just Catholicism, that the Torah is a man-made document. And um, therefore Moshe didn't write the Torah. And therefore miracles uh, don't happen in the way we envision them. Miracles are part of nature and nature is God. And that God is not a God you pray to. So by the time these two books have been written, Spinoza's philosophy um, had questioned, at least for the Jewish people. And the reason I say modernity is because all the philosophy that follows after Spinoza, and that's why in the realms of Jewish philosophy, Jewish philosophers argue to this day, can we call Spinoza a Jewish philosopher or is he a philosopher who is Jewish? Uh, there's very little Jewishness in any of his writings, except we discuss his things against Torah uh, and things like that. Though he did say, and, and almost contradicted himself, and I remember this a long time ago, but uh, being asked one day, can the Jewish people ever return to a homeland in the um, theoretical, you know, in the uh, book about theology and politics, he seems to negate the idea, even though it seems that to other people he had written that, no, 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 it could be God, you know, Jewish people could return one day, but it would not have nothing to have anything to do with God. Um, so <clears throat> this, he's with his books. Now, why did the Jewish community excommunicate him? Um, weren't there other people who had this, these beliefs? And the answer is no. We look at the records of the Spanish uh, community in Amsterdam, and about 40 people in total were put in Kherim. But the Kherim lasted for sometimes for a day. In fact, uh, Henry, they didn't like uh, Menashe ben Israel, so he was in Kherim for a day for something. Uh, but people immediately, the Kherim put you right back into your community. Spinoza was happy. He never looked back to the community. Um, that he might have had Jewish visitors, some very important people from his old community. It seems he did for a while. But eventually Spinoza retires um, from the community, moves somewhere else, um, learns the art. He was not very good at business. In fact, the business that he inherited from his father that he ran with his brother ran into financial issues. So he was not a good business, but he learned how to help make manufacture and polish lenses, which were just becoming quite popular. Of course, the telescope and Galileo is right here at this time. So he polishes lenses as a living, and that's part of the reason he already had a breathing illness as a child. Uh, you can see in this picture how frail he looks right there. And lo and behold, suddenly Spinoza <coughs> had inhaled too much glass. So at the age of 44, he he passes from the Jewish people. Um, that's what we would say maybe, because at some point you want some credit for this fellow. Um, but at the end of the day, his ideas have now crept into the mindset of people. Not immediately because the book's unpublished there, but suddenly questions and there are reports about him and what he had said and how he said it, that suddenly the air of the 1600s has in it a tremendous amount of modernity, not the one that was coming from the non-Jewish world, just the fact that religion itself, not just the Jewish religion, uh, all of Christendom put him in Kherim. He ended up on the, on the Catholic list of forbidden books too. To this day, Spinoza is not uh, <clears throat> someone who's welcomed. Yet, all of science today would not be around without him. Literally, all of the modern period and everything that follows rests on the shoulders of this excommunicated Jew from Amsterdam. So that happens in Amsterdam. 
early 1600s, coming into the middle of the 1600s, and of course, the impetus, the book slightly later. We'll come back to Amsterdam one more minute. But something else happens, if you remember, in, in the 1600s. And that is travel from Amsterdam straight down to Turkey and stop in the city. It's about 2,000 some miles, about 3,000 kilometers. So just shoot the arrow straight, um, slightly, um, <clears throat> slightly to the east, southeast, and you'll hit the city of Smyrna, in Hebrew known as Izmir. Uh, in 1626, Izmir is the birthplace of the most famous Mashiach of the Jewish people. When I say Mashiach, uh, what do you mean? We didn't have a Mashiach yet, we're waiting. Yeah, so let me use the phrase that I love to use. This is not, um, you know, a false Mashiach. And let me clarify that. I am pretty convinced that the Jewish people have never had a false Mashiach. They've had what we would call a failed Messiah. And let me explain. Every one of the false messiahs that call themselves Jewish, or the Mashiachim, if you want, that have come along, um, and there's about 50 of them in Jewish history, by the way, five zero. So maybe we'll have a lecture in the future, a history of all the false messiahs in the Jewish people. That would take four weeks. But we can maybe do it in an hour if we're really crazy. But Shabtai Tzvi believed he was Mashiach. Now he's born in 1526, again in, in Smyrna, in Turkey, also a very smart kid. Uh, we wouldn't call him brilliant. Learns Kabbalah also at an early age. And to make a long story short, the Betin in Izmir uh, contains reports and some reports are brought to them that this young man, um, Shabtai ben Markai, uh, Zevi or Tzvi, has been doing ma'asim zarim, strange things. Now, some of the strange things are like he pronounced the Yud uh, and things like that, at which point Ben calls him in at the age of 18. Shabtai Tzvi is told, you know, Ben Shmonese Lechupa, you're 18 already, you're a young man, you're actually studying Torah with other people who respect you. You, you have a little bit of a leadership position, uh, you should be married. And of course, <coughs> Shabtai, <coughs> excuse me, so Shabtai Tzvi gets married. And <coughs> within a short time, um, the wife, who they had just married, comes to the Betan and Smyrna and says, uh, he hasn't yet consummated the marriage. Uh, at which point, she would want to end this marriage and the marriage is ended. And that happens again. So Shabtai Tzvi has two marriages, which you want to call, there's something strange with this person, exactly what, who knows. Um, and of course, historians have come up with all types of medical terms to try to understand this from a medical point of view, and who knows. But uh, at some point, still in Smyrna, before he leaves, Shabtai Tzvi decides to marry a Sefer Torah. You heard me correctly. He declares the Torah to be his bride. And when that Masez Zar, when that strange act happens, He's driven from the community and he leaves. So Shabtai Tzvi wanders in the Jewish world. To make a long story short, he ends up in, in, in Cairo for a while. From Cairo, he travels to Gaza. And in Gaza, he meets a very important person. So by now, we're roughly in the late 1640s, early 1650s. And Shabtai Tzvi comes across a very famous person you might know from history in English as Nathan of Gaza. In Hebrew, he's called Natan Ha'azati. Nathan of Gaza was literally a, uh, he was called this and people called him 
a very famous Kabbalist too, but Nathan of Gaza uh, was called a Rofe HaNefesh. This Rofe HaNefesh uh, title tells you much about, and so it's quite a common title. You know, you go to a Rofe HaGuf, if there's something wrong with the physical body, you go to a Rofe HaNefesh, which had been a term, actually Maimonides had used in one of his uh, commentaries to the Mishnah, that when you have a spiritual issue, and this Natan HaAzati, Nathan known as the one who would help people with spiritual issues. And somehow, uh, by the late 1650s, um, there's a discussion about Messianism. To make a long story short, a woman has shown up in this area um, whose name was Sarah. Now, Sarah might have been married before. She had been in Amsterdam, by the way. She's now in, in, in this part of the world. Her parents, and I'll just mention this event because we'll need it for next week, but we'll need it for today too. Her parents had been victims of the Chmalnitsky pogroms. Now, Poland is next week, but at least let's put it out there. Between 1648 and 1649, Bogdan Chmelnitsky had destroyed the Polish Jewish community. And I'll call it the golden age of Poland had come to an end in 1648. She somehow escaped, uh, gone to Amsterdam, where some actually say she was a prostitute, ending up in this part of the world uh, and lo and behold, um, sometime around 1664, Mazel Tov, Shabtai Tzvi marries Sarah or Sarah, the former prostitute. Of course, if you remember, there was an Avi who was told to take a Isha Znunim, um, but you know, Hosea, and it's a whole different discussion, but there was precedent for someone to say, wait a second, and again, I'm not going there with the idea and what all this leads in here, but Shabtai Tzvi is now married and he's happy with this marriage. And then about a year later, um, around 1665, March, April, Nathan of Gaza tells Shabtai Tzvi, I believe you're the Messiah. And Shabtai Tzvi is hesitant, and Sarah basically says, but I know you're it. And that was all it took. And that leads to the most devastating event to the Jewish world of the 1600s. And that's Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi now, uh, with the help of Nathan of Gaza, has himself anointed in Gaza, uh, sometime in, a, in the month of May as Mashiach. And soon, by the time we hit the, the later part of, of 1665, letters begin to pop into Europe all across language, Shiach is here, reading descriptions of the excitement across the entire Jewish world. Literally, the excitement spreads in the Sephardi world, the Ashkenazi world. People are selling their businesses. People are going up to non-Jews and saying, huh, the English newspapers in England uh, are reporting this already at the beginning of six. 66. The word is out there that the Jewish Messiah has come. The amount of boats that are rented across Europe that are coming to Yerushalayim, the amount of excitement and repentance, and people suddenly prophesizing, and these are accurate accounts, people suddenly began to Call it Jerusalem syndrome in a different way, maybe. Uh, people are just predicting 
the Mashiach is here. And of course, you know, the story, and again, it deserves much longer than I'm giving it, but Shabtai Tzvi goes to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, uh, riding on a donkey, of course, the rabbis, they were not too sure about him, and they actually write a letter to Smyrna, guys from you, what do you say about him? They write back, I don't know, this guy can't really be Mashiach, he's done crazy things here, but it, it doesn't matter the fever and the fervor that swept up the Jewish world all the way into Yemen, clearly into areas of Poland that in 1648 had been decimated. It's now 1666. This must be the Messiah. To end the story and make it the reality and it should hit us, um, he eventually ends up, for whatever good or bad reason, with the head of the Ottoman Empire. The Sultan, who basically, to make a long story short, says to him, look, you either convert to Islam or I'll kill you. And in September of 1666, Shabtai Tzvi converts to Islam. Shock across the Jewish world. Shock. Do we need to convert with him? Do we just let it go? Um, how many people still believed in him? By the way, some up to almost um, when Nazis were collecting Jews, they still collected some Jews who still believed in Shabtai Tzvi. It lasted into the 1900s, the secret belief in Shabtai Tzvi. Uh, of Muslims, by the way, the firm is Dernme, who only revealed to the world who they are in the 1900s. Uh, these were secret beliefs of Shabtai Tzvi for all this time. So I see we're out of time, but just realize what these two events, leaving the 1500s and how that impacted the 1600s, because of the ideas of Spinoza, because of a failed Jewish Messiah and what that wrought about, the authority in Torah and Halakha was weakened beyond repair. It really was because like, I believe and trust in my rabbis. And by the way, the majority of rabbis, uh, and you can see it, you can see the censorship, like, oh, no, no, no. Good, wonderful rabbis and for good reason believe Shabtai Tzvi was it. And the massive tshuva movement, for what purpose now? Do we all convert to Islam? Which some did. Does only the Messiah convert to Islam because he has to remove the sparks of holiness that are in Islam? And I mean that serious so see how Kabbalah influenced part of this and at the same time the next movement that comes in our religious world after this is the beginning of the reform without Shabbat and all this. So the Jewish world and our travels into modernity has a tremendous amount of new challenges. Uh, I know I've gone over time but I will uh, unmute if you have any questions or you can unmute yourselves. So, uh, Rabbi, I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. So you mentioned earlier that there was a place for these 50 uh, false Mashiachs or whatever you want to say in our history, yeah. but you kind of didn't bring it full circle, even though you got to, at least covering one of them. Can you just explain oh, yeah, that? I'm not discussing them unless we do that at some future time. Right, right. Not, 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 not Updates not is one of about 50, correct. Right, but how does it fit into our history? Any other questions? If not, I apologize for starting late. Okay, anybody else? Uh, maybe in the future we'll have a lecture. Anybody else have any questions? If not, thank you so much for bearing with, with the thank beginning you. and we'll straighten it out for next week. Again, I want to thank Beth Jacob for hosting this and uh, hopefully by next week, the real Mashiach will come and we'll be the Shalim. I see for those of you joining me from the East Coast, uh, 
go to sleep. It's kind of late. So thank you guys. Thank you. Be well. Rabbi, thank you. Rabbi thank Lieberman. You. I don't know if he's there. Rabbi? Yeah. Uh, Ayala here. I just want to let you know that your sound system Are you saying something? It's not in sync. Did you hear me? Not